Today I'm going to talk about biodiversity, nature and the built environment. And to talk about this with me, I have one of the leading architects when it comes to biodiversity, and that is Mette Skjop from SLA Architects. Welcome, Mette. Thank you very much, Anne. It's a pleasure, and I've been looking forward to introduce uh, our nature-based design studio, creating space for life, all life. We are still designers and architects. But we have uh, over 130 employees, and our studio is, is interdisciplinary, which means that we don't only have architects and urban planners, but we also have biologists, we have anthropologists, we have specialists on different topics from soil to to, uh, to biotopes, how do we design the best biotope in order to, for example, clean air or, or make the city more resilient uh, on, uh, after a heavy rain. And Medu, we're going to talk about uh, biodiversity today and how, if, if you can say it just very shortly, why is biodiversity important to us humans? Because most of the time we're inside in the buildings. True. Um, biodiversity as such uh, is uh, globally uh, on, a, on, a, on a really uh, declining uh, dark spiral going downwards. We are uh, overusing, almost abusing uh, nature's resources uh, on a global scale. And since uh, the end of Second World War, the, the, the way we develop or, or think about growth as humans, uh, biodiversity and the natural resources in general hasn't been part of the equation. So how do we, I mean, we as humans are also living matter and we are embedded in nature. We depend on it. So that is why we, uh, on, on our bigger purpose and the bigger why that SLA is in the world, is to, to reconnect the, the knowledge we know about the performance of nature with uh, people in a new nature design in cities. So it's not to introduce uh, wolves and mooses on the streets uh, of a city, but to introduce new type of design where nature is actually, you know, the substance and biodiversity is the substance and the core goal uh, of of how we operate. And Mid, what what do we know about how biodiversity uh, affects our health uh, as humans? I mean, one thing is, of course, we want to uh, look at uh, biodiversity and enjoy it, but does it also affect our health directly if we lose uh, or as we are losing biodiversity? Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, World Health Organization, WHO, um, has a study that shows direct correlation between people's access to green spaces, urban forest, parks, etc., directly related to their lifespan. So how long do we live? That's directly related. Uh, and, and there's a rule of thumb that has... Uh, that has uh, that has been uh, done uh, that is like 3, 30, 300. And it summarizes many different research fields into a single set of rules for healthier, greener cities. And this 3, 30, 300 is that you should have like view to at least three trees from every home, that 30% of, uh, of uh, of the area should be covered by canopy, so the canopy of trees in every neighborhood. And then the, the maximum distance to an urban green area, a park, an urban forest, uh, something like that, a pocket park, should be maximum 300 meters. That is kind of a rule of thumb that we at the SLA in our urban planning and urban development uh, both uh, in Denmark, but also around the world, 
uh, is, is trying to put into practice on a planning uh, scale, you could see, because it summarizes that that makes a healthier environment for people in cities. So it's, it's on a pre preventing side instead of, you know, diagnosing and a quick fix. If you go to Japan, it's simply a diagnosis that, that the doctor can describe to a patient. You lack contact with nature because it does, uh, on, a census, uh, uh, on a census part, it does something to our nervous system that is directly measurable. So if this uh, rule of thumb is in place, uh, three trees, 30% canopy, and 300 meters to the nearest park, what is the direct effect on our health? How can we sort of feel it uh, in, our, in our bodies when we, have these, when we have nature and biodiversity close to us? What are the benefits? The benefits is that we, as, as just explained, is that our nervous systems uh, relate directly to uh, to a living system as nature is or a tree is, so it affects our uh, our our senses uh, directly. Um, it also provides a space where we explore nature, uh, and then our um, it's 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 proven it's not something that SLA has uh, has experienced or has done research on. Uh, but it is, uh, is, it's proven that it, it provides uh, uh, people with stress, people who feels lonely, people who, who has other traumas, a direct effect on our, on, on, on our mental health in general and our physical uh, as well. In, in, you could say that um, during COVID, I mean, people were almost lying about experiences with nature. No? So it was a huge demand for people living in nature and all our uh, urban uh, spaces that had green uh, in it was, uh, was heavily used. You, you know, you'd all, you almost had to sort of uh, effective, make it more effective. You had to sort of frame in that you can stay here for people and here in this box, you could stay for another four people. So it was a huge demand, uh, but also you could say on another part where it's more informal, uh, at least from my point of view, it's, it's uh, COVID has also, uh, you know, the, 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 the percentage of, of humans living in, in, in cities, feeling lonely has uh, expanded. No, it has really, really uh, increased. Uh, whereas nature in general uh, and nature spaces in, in, in a proximity to your house can, can create a space where you can have like informal meeting. But if you don't, if there's not other people, then you can at least, you know, uh, contemplate and have like a quiet uh, moment in the sun and relate to, to living matter as nature is. Uh, WHO also uh, stamped a, a, a huge research done on uh, a million kids, children, uh, from given birth to the age of 18, where you are formerly adult. Uh, and on satellite photos, they, one of the conclusions was that the children who grew up in close daily contact with nature and nature experiences and basically played and it was part of their everyday life, they had 50% less risk of getting uh, the 17 uh, biggest uh, mental diseases. That's very, um, that's very, uh, that's a very powerful uh, fact that you can reduce mental illness with almost 50% if you're close to nature. And that's why this biodiversity crisis has a huge impact on us humans. Um, so, I would like to move on to uh, biodiversity and sustainability, because what is the connection here? Because one thing is that we need biodiversity for our health, but how does it correlate with sustainability? That's a good question. I mean, with, in my regards, uh, sustainability is, uh, I mean, biodiversity is beyond sustainability, you could say. 
So it, it to, to say that it's it's the fact that you can, I mean, the European Union uh, sustainability requirements that is definitely sharpened and will be tightened uh, and it will be implemented by the January 2023. Their requirements for investment include biodiversity as a core parameter. So in principle, the fact that you, uh, I mean, we do that all the time in the built environment, continue with business as usual, and call it sustainable, so so to speak, greenwash it. Um, this new taxonomy and and core parameter of putting biodiversity uh, has its radical demands on uh, not developing areas uh, without uh, including the value proposition of biodiversity. And to and we have like a series of customers who already do that as a strategic level to. To, to on a, on a five-year plan, be nature positive on what they do from now and so forward. So as a, as a design studio, we, we invest in influence and push this biodiversity agenda, both regarding planning act, regional planning and municipal planning uh, to create better conditions for the life in general, both for humans, but for all life uh, in cities. And it, um, there is this, uh... Thing called Earth Overshoot Day. Can you explain what yes. that is, and what is Denmark's uh, uh, day Overshoot Day? Well, in Denmark, as as if we if we take Denmark as one country, then we use approximately four times uh, the natural resources that the nature uh, and our planet generate through in a year. So you could say we start overshooting and overusing. Uh, around the end of March, I think it's the 29th or the 28th of March. And in general, we need to plan. Yeah, that's that's very bad. So in in Denmark, we are uh, we are not performing well on biodiversity as a country at all. We are actually super bad at it. If you see the European assessment on on this, on you know the the 17 goals, then life on 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 land and life in see we are performing super bad and and in general i mean we we should be able as a as an agile smaller country that are skilled all the knowledge is there we should be able to to change uh, more more agile we should be more able to be more agile and and change uh, faster you could say so the concept of earth overshoot day is that every country has um, an amount of, uh, uh, I don't know what you say, there's, there's some resources that we can use during a year. And some countries uh, are good at not overshooting and some countries like Denmark are really bad at it. So who, which country is best? Are there anyone who doesn't overshoot? That's a very good question. I can't remember all the facts, but um, but in general, it's it's per capita. So how many people are living in Denmark? How many people are living in in uh, in the states? Uh, but in general, the Western world are overusing. You could say we are the ones who are uh, very early yes. on in the yeah. year. We already used up all the resources that we were supposed to be able to to have for a whole year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, in general, you could also say that at SLA we have this uh, 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 life analysis where we kind of, uh, uh, instead of looking at only biodiversity or one topic at the time, we work interdisciplinary and start with the cities to, to analyze the biological value, what's the baseline, what is already there, and there's always something. Even though it's just like tarmac or asphalt, there's always something. Uh, and then we also include in the the social part. How is what's the problem? Is it is it not unsafe to go out after dark hours? Is it uh, is it an area where uh, where there's a lot of young uh, people uh, that has a lot of uh, free time? Uh, and then we connect the two of them. How do we actually create space for both a flea market and the ground beetles? It is possible. 
and how do we create safe habitats for both hedgehogs and senior citizens? So how do you connect that and, and make like one plus one to 11? And that's possible because nature-based design in general is, is, is growing. So our life analysis uh, is, is still an ongoing model that we, uh, that we work on here at uh, SLA, but that's basically how we evolve and, and look into a baseline of a project in order to get it, not as, you know, something that you, an aftermath, but something that you are, uh, are certain about and then that you can actually evolve over time where you build or climate adapt or make a new urban area or a transformation from industry to a living area or a, a public uh, street in general. So this is a tool that SLA uses when entering a new city, a new area, you make this analysis based on what you, when, what you have to work with. Yes, and that's both a qualitative one and a quantitative one. So it's both a desktop analysis, but also a field study. Uh, and that's very important. In general, you could also say that Denmark uh, is, is a DGN, DGNB, which is a, a, a heavily used assessment method in, in, in buildings uh, and sustainability in general in Denmark. It's more a qualitative, biodiversity is more qualitative a part of that, but it needs to be quantitative as well. Uh, it's not only something that you feel and sense and, oh, that's nice, but you sort of need to have it as a hardcore part of, of what we measure. Just as issue day is a measure, it's a quantitative analysis, no? Is there any economic benefits from uh, biodiversity in the cities. How, how does these two very different uh, parts of life correspond? Because everyone can agree it's nice with biodiversity, but there's also a free market out there. So have you made any economical an analysis regarding biodiversity uh, and sustainability in, in the cities? I know that we, the, that you and I talked about the Skupta, uh, Sir the Skupta, who, who conducted a whole report for the Ministry of Finance in, in England, in, in UK. Uh, and he's an economist, he, he's a professor in the economy. Um, and he conducted a whole uh, study on how biodiversity and in economy as such is connected. And, and, and that's, you know, if you read the report, there's also a, a more light version review. Uh, one of the, the, the statement that he starts with is what I said before, that after the Second World War, war, biodiversity and nature's resources was not part of the equation for growth in our societal models. So our model world, as we know it today, doesn't have that quantified as part of, uh, of the equation, but it needs to be um, implemented. And I can say as, as, uh, as a studio, it's, it's still uh, not easy uh, to, to, sort of, to sort of push that agenda. It's, even though it's, it's demanded from, from citizens in general, then it's, uh, it's, still, it's still hard. And, and cities in general are hardscape, no? It is like, uh, yeah. Um, so, Mary, when we're talking about the built environment, because you said cities are hardscapes, we are we are very. Uh, when we think about a city, we think about the built environment. So, how can we, apart from making green areas, of course, but how can we incorporate biodiversity into the built environment? Well, that is what we are already doing. But it's uh, it's on many different scales. I mean, it re it's from the, you know the the, the government. Uh, it needs to be implemented in all different scales. Where where as as a society, a contemporary society right now, people in general are demanding it. They want connection with nature, where they live, and people in general live more and more in the cities. And that is definitely a a growing. Uh, sort of uh, direction. Um, 
So, but how do you practically work with it? How do you? How? What is the process? If there's an uh, building uh, that's uh, about to be designed or be built, where do you enter the process, and what is your effect on it? I mean, if we work together with a if, with an architecture studio that does uh, the building, then we do the rest. You could say, and and uh, internally we are like, well, we are out in the dynamics of weather, so we need to be much more resilient in our design, and it has to be adaptive. Uh, climate ad ad adaptation is one part of it to secure that that it, it the the city program actually functions. Uh, even during drought or during heavy rains, but also on a on a on an everyday basis. Uh, so, as a studio, we then try to push as much much nature into that specific area as possible. Uh, and how is that going? Is that is that a hard to sell, or is it? Uh, are you are you the, the architects on the other side of the table? Are they understanding the importance? of biodiversity like you do or is it still do you still have to sort of like you're doing to me here trying to convince everyone how important it is we still have to do that but that differs i mean if you go to toronto they have a biodiversity plan that is beyond economic uh, in the, in the city of toronto because they have like the, their baseline of nature and their uh, everyday life of nature is such it's is so present uh, whereas uh, you could go to Copenhagen, we have tried for a long time to sort of push the agenda there. Uh, they are definitely doing a lot of very nice things and a lot of green stuff, but it, it differs from, from uh, project to project and city to city and government to government. Paris, for example, uh, who was just like, had like an extreme uh, rain event last week, um, does have also the biodiversity plan that is straight under the Lord Mayor. Uh, so it differs from project to project. No? And, and we are not the only studio who has experienced that, but we are one of the studios who are fronting and pioneering that biodiversity as a quantitative, but also a qualitative parameter in evolving our and developing our cities uh, is very important. And we have, we have, I mean, invested in that for for many years uh, and still trying to get clients to actually pay for it. Yeah, you were founded in 1994 by uh, Stiel Andersson, who is it's his initials in, in your, your studio name. And you have been working on this uh, dedicated for so many years, but I guess there is a shift now in, in, in time where we all recognize the importance uh, of uh, mental health regarding biodiversity, but also the economic part of it, as you mentioned. But maybe the time uh, is for you to present the project so we can see uh, how you work. Hmm? Uh, one thing, and, and uh, it was because you talked about the built environment and the grown environment, which we uh, handle here as a design studio. Uh, and, and it's of course, uh, biodiversity is important. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this discussion. And it's good that we can handle biodiversity on the construction side of, for example, a new neighborhood. But the most significant impact is actually off-site. So we need to put biodiversity into the total supply chain of what we build and what we do in our cities. So. Do you understand that to, to have like it into the value chain of the total life cycle analysis of what we do? So how it's not only what we put on a specific site, but it's how are the materials done? How, what type of materials? How do we see to the production of, yeah, concrete, uh, uh, solid wood uh, and so forth. We need to have it into that, uh, yeah. So biodiversity in general follows the same development as, as climate uh, ha has done in investment and construction. And some of the sa same tools used to make climate uh, accounts uh, are under development for biodiversity. So, but in general, for, for us as a studio, we are just like, all the knowledge is there. We know how to do it. 
we just need to to act on it and actually take it seriously because we depend on it. Is it frustrating for you sometimes? To, from time to time, yes. Because you have the knowledge, but you know the effect, but when it's but we're not we're not acting on it. Yeah, but it's also good to have abrasiveness. No, it's good to have sort of uh, something that you uh, that you need to push forward, uh, and that's where it's also super nice uh, for me as a person when I'm you know frustrated. Then I simply have like a half a day at the studio and and talk to people about other other projects and and then. Uh, but in general, I would also say that um, times are changing. If you asked me three years ago, I would be more frustrated. That's good. That's positive. That's positive, definitely. Should we look at uh, one of your projects? We can do that. This is a project, uh, actually a competition that we won uh, in 2015. And it was finalized uh, in 2020. It's a normal roundabout and a street, a housing street uh, in an area, a neighborhood in, in, in Copenhagen, where we should climate adapt, adapt, adapt where we should adapt to uh, future rain events, heavy rain events uh, in the city. So in, in basic, it's about, we, we for centuries, we have uh, made infrastructure convex in order to get the rain away from the street. Uh, but here the idea is to make it concave in order to put it in nature, to filter noise, to clean air, to create uh, a healthy urban space where people can meet and uh, enjoy uh, life in connection with nature. We have uh, taken away two thirds of asphalt in these two, uh, in the street and the roundabout. And the program for traffic, uh, parking lots, uh, you know, the, the turning radius of, 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 uh, of bigger cars is still the same. So we use it as an example to, to convince uh, our clients, uh, our collaborators that there is actually space for nature in our cities. This, this project, uh, this image is, is half a year after we finalized the project. And at least, if, and it looks like it's been there forever. We planted around uh, 600 trees, uh, 100,000 uh, different uh, understory, so under the trees. Uh, types of grasses and, and plants mm. and perennials. And our biologists, they, they can't help uh, monitoring how is biodiversity actually uh, developing on this site. And already from, from, from planting, because we know what we plant and what we put into a project like this, but already after uh, planting, a hundred new species of flora fauna has been, uh, has been found uh, in this normal housing street and a roundabout. But in, in, in general, you could also say we couldn't do this as, as architects only or designers only. Uh, and I think one of the, the major issues on, uh, and challenges that we need to sort of change radically is to work much more interdisciplinary. And not only as a school design studio, but to actually uh, get all the value proposition into the processes of, of uh, evolving and developing our society. Uh, and I think that's one of the issues that, is actually, that we are actually suffering from today is that we take one thing at the time instead of looking at, and it is more cha chaotic, but it's also super much more interesting and to, to, to work like that. So here you have a, a an everyday situation with the bikes and the, and a woman walking her uh, her child uh, maybe on her way to daycare, but it's it's just to say that this is like a normal roundabout, no? and and ultimately you could uh, scale this to other cities uh, and other neighborhoods.
Uh, yeah, and here you see the street cutting through almost like a forestry-like uh, environment, but it is infrastructure, no? And normally a roundabout in a city, you, you don't want to be in the middle of the roundabout as a human. It doesn't feel safe. But here you sort of turned it upside down and made the, the roundabout into a little forest, actually. Yeah, exactly. So you use this project as an example when you have to convince other clients, uh, maybe cities uh, or, um, or countries even, that you can actually combine infrastructure and biodiversity. Yeah. And space for life. I mean, people thrive. And even if you just look at hardcore economy, Every time there's an apartment for, for rent or for sale in this neighborhood, the first image is like a view to this now. So we all want it to some extent. And what, what kinds of, uh, you, you talk about uh, the, the interdisciplinary uh, work. So what disciplines have been at work here? Architects and biologists and, and what else? Anthropologists and then a whole series of technical expertises uh, traffic uh, infrastructure uh, specialists. Uh, how does uh, how do we actually uh, ensure that during winter time, when the streets are salted, that the the, the water streams and the water is collected, uh, and then it's there's like a first flush, even during summer when when the rainwater hits the road that is contaminated. So there's a whole it's a whole system. This is like a system. No, it's it's not like a product, and you just like put in the plug. This is like a system that adjusts over time and also adjusts to the local climate. So we have had like a lot of uh, specialists, and of of course also a uh, a nice collaboration with the city of of Copenhagen, who's been willing to actually test and pioneer and pilot this type of uh, of of a. Uh, of a climate adaptation project that it, that pushes biodiversity uh, on a large scale. Very inspiring. Uh, Mette Skjold, thank you very much for uh, talking with me today about your work with the, your very important work with the biodiversity. I hope that all roundabouts in all of the world will look like this. In the <laughs> thank you, Anne. And come and visit us here at the studio one day if you would like. I will, but More I have to stay at my desk all day because I'm a very busy architect. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but it's good to get out there, no? It is. I have to get out and it will be good for my mental health. Thank you very much. I think so. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.